Amen. We got a cool breeze blowing now, don't we? Welcome to our celebration of the resurrection. We're so glad that all of you are here with us today. Let's thank our praise team week after week. They do a fantastic job of leading us in praise and worship. Thank you. A group of friends that attended the same church and decided that they would have a rotating fellowship meal at each of their homes and the host home would be in charge of the meal every time they were at that house. Well, one uh, week, Al and Janet decided to be the host and Janet wanted to do some special meal. So she got this idea from Pinterest or somewhere that she would do mushroom smothered steak for the group. So she went to the grocery store to get the mushrooms and they were really expensive. So she told her husband, I, I, I don't think we can do the mushroom steak. It just costs too much. He said, listen, we've got mushrooms growing down in the backyard of the creek. Just go down there and get some of those. She said, well, now, I've heard that those could be poisonous. He said, well, I see the rabbits eating them all the time, and they do just fine. So she went down and got some mushrooms, and she cleaned them up and sliced them up, and she decided she'd better test it. So they had this dog named Spot, and Spot was out on the back deck, so she took a bowl of the mushrooms out to Spot, and he gobbled them down right away. So all morning long, she watched him to see how he was going to do, and he did just fine. So she told her husband, okay, it looks like we're good to go. So she fixed the smothered steak and with the mushrooms, and everybody came over, and they sat down, and they ate, and they just loved it. Everything was good. So then they decided they would sit down and play games and things like that. So they were socializing and playing games. And a, and a neighbor came and rang the doorbell. And she went to the door and opened it up. And the neighbor said, I'm sorry to tell you, but old Spot's out in the front yard. He's dead. <laughs> so she panicked. She went into hysteria. She thought, oh, no, everybody's going to die. So she immediately called the paramedics and called the doctor, and they all said, we, I think we can catch this in time. Everybody's going to be okay. We'll send an ambulance over. The doctor said, I'll be there in a few minutes. And he said, he said here's what we got to do. Everybody's going to have to get an enema, and everybody's going to have to get their stomach pumped. So the ambulance got there, the doctor got there one by one, they gave them all an enema, they pumped all their stomachs, and after it was all done, the doctor said, uh, I'm going now, I think everything's going to be okay. So everybody just kind of sat down, they were kind of weak and feeling pretty rough, and the neighbor had stayed the whole time and sat down beside Janet and said, that's, that's bad. She said, what do you mean? She said he didn't even stop. She said, who didn't stop? She said, the guy that ran over Spot. <laughs> you see, it, it helps to have all the information, doesn't it? <laughs> to know all the details. And on this Resurrection Sunday, there's millions of people all over the world celebrating what we believe to be the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we believe there's plenty of evidence, there's plenty of details to support our faith, our confidence in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. In Matthew chapter 28, remember those women that first went to the tomb that morning? They weren't going there expecting the tomb to be empty. They were not going there. They didn't have all the details yet that we have. The, the information that we have now, they didn't have that yet. And so they went to the tomb to finish embalming the body. They had not been able to complete the preparation of the body when they took him down off of the cross on Friday because the Passover had come and they had to hurry and get him into that tomb before they could finish all the preparations. So now they came expecting to do that. But when they came, they were met by an angel. And it says in Matthew 28 and verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Now, friends, those women still didn't know for sure that this was true. But they had more information now. They had more of the details. The angels had told them that he had risen from the dead. So now they went and they hurried to tell the other disciples. 
And now these disciples had more information. And they ran to the tomb to check it out for themselves. And even then, when they found the tomb empty, they didn't have all the details yet, did they? They still weren't sure. Jesus had told them this was going to happen. He had predicted it. He had prophesied it. But still, they had to see for themselves. And so Jesus made sure they had all the details, all the information they needed. When they were in that room with all the doors locked, Jesus appeared to them miraculously, risen and alive. They were able to see him, talk to him, reach out and touch him. They knew for a fact Jesus had conquered death. And it changed everything. From that day on, instead of hiding for their lives, instead of being afraid to speak up anymore, instead of thinking all hope was lost, they began to preach a new message, a powerful message. A message that began to ring out across the land and by the thousands of people who were alive at that time, who knew the evidence, who were, who were hearing the testimony, who were being given the details, by the thousands they began to respond to the gospel invitation to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. We have a, record, a record of that first sermon that the apostles preached about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's recorded in Acts chapter 2. And beginning in verse 22, it says this. Peter was preaching and he said, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Friends, that is the message that changed everything. That is the information that we all need to have to know where our hope lies. The resurrection of Jesus Christ speaks to every challenge we face in life. The first thing is this. The resurrection speaks to the nature of truth. What is true and what is not true. We live in a world now where fake news is everywhere. You don't know what to believe. You don't know what you can put your trust in anymore. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ screams out to us. You can put your hope in Jesus. You can put your hope in the one who has proven. If Jesus rose from the dead, then biblical Christianity is true. Period. There is no question about it. There is no doubt anymore. If he conquered death, then everything he said is true. Everything the apostles shared is true when they gave their testimony about Jesus. I say this every Easter, and I say it in between, too, because it's true. I made up my mind a long time ago that I'm never going to worship a dead guy. I just decided that's not good for me. And maybe you, you can understand what I'm talking about. You see, here's the thing. Uh, we talk about this at Lakeshore a lot. You know what the death rate is in Tennessee? 100%. You know what it is across the United States? You know what it is worldwide? 100%. I'm not going to worship and follow somebody who doesn't have an answer for death because all of us face this. All of us need to have some hope in the face of death. For our friends, for our loved ones, for ourselves, we know we're going to face this. There have been a lot of other good teachers out there. Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, Krishna, Gandhi, the Dalai Lama, Mary Baker Eddy, Joseph Smith. They all had some good things to say, every one of them. And any other religious leader or a religious leader of any group out there had some good things to say. But you can visit their graves and they're still there. None of them has an answer for the one thing we know we're all going to face. Not a one has a way to give us victory in the face of death. There's only one teacher that's ever proven beyond any shadow of a doubt that not only has he got a theoretical answer, he's got proof of his answer that he can conquer sin and death for us. And in Christ, we can have that confidence, that hope, that victory. Jesus did not just talk a good game. He predicted he was going to conquer death, and then he did it. It's easy to teach nice platitudes. It takes great power to overcome the reality of death. And only Jesus has demonstrated that power. Well, he not only speaks to the nature of what is true through the resurrection, he also speaks to the nature of life itself. 
It proves that man did not evolve from pond scum or apes and that our lives do not end at the grave. We are created in the image of an eternal God. We are living souls. And the source of life is God himself. Friends, that means that we're not just here to recreate and procreate and accumulate and then disintegrate. We are made for eternity with our Creator. Our lives have meaning and purpose both here and now and beyond this temporary existence on this earth. So the resurrection speaks to the nature of truth. It speaks to the nature of human life that we come from an eternal God. It also speaks to the nature of humankind. Despite what the philosophers keep trying to tell us, human beings are not essentially good, needing just a little bit of refinement along the way. Just read a few self-help books. Just go through a few seminars and a few programs. Keep working to improve yourself, and sooner or later you'll get it right, they say. Sooner or later you'll reach this place where, where we get our act together as human beings. Yeah, how's that working out for us? Every day we see evil reigning in our world. In fact, we see it even in what we call good people. I saw it this morning with some of you trying to get into the parking lot today. <laughs> no matter how good a mood you were in coming to celebrate the resurrection, when somebody cut you off, the evil rose up again. <laughs> when you couldn't find that place to park, the evil kept coming back. Friends, every other religion in the world is about self-improvement by your own works, by your own efforts. Only Christianity gives us an honest appraisal of our sin problem. Only Christianity offers a Savior. And the greatest need we all have, what's the death rate again? 100%. 100%. And the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. The only answer for our sin problem is the answer that we find in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as nice as all the other teachings are, they do not give us the honest truth about human beings. Nothing short of the power of the death, burial, and resurrection of God's Son could break the power of sin and death in our lives. And no self-help improvement program you put yourself on will ever take care of the sin problem. It will not. So we need a Savior. And only Christianity offers a Savior. But the resurrection also speaks to the nature of God's love for all of us. I want you to know this today. I want you to hear this loud and clear. You are a much loved person whether you like it or not. God loves every one of you. John 3.16 is true and God proved it to be true for the cross. God so loved the world. And you can put your name right there. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have, an, have everlasting life. God is a relentless lover of your soul. He could have simply walked away and left us in our sin. The scripture tells us that Jesus at any point could have called 10,000 angels and stopped all of this. But he went through with it. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, though he despised the shame of it. There's only one answer for why Jesus went through hell for us. And that's because he loved us that much. And he still loves you that much. Right here, right now, today. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, what you haven't accomplished, that you wanted to accomplish. God's love never changes. And if you ever question for one moment whether or not God cares about you, whether God loves you or not, when you've messed up, when you've come short, when you, when you think you failed miserably, remember the cross. Remember what Jesus was willing to do for you there. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ tells us that his love for you took him to the cross. There's no greater love than this, the scripture says, that a man lay down his life for his friends. God has chosen to love every one of you. And he's demonstrated it by being willing to die for you. I want to close with one last one. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ also speaks to the nature of adversity, of the struggles, of the problems, of the challenges that we face in life. I want you to think back to that horrible Friday afternoon when Jesus was nailed to the cross. Peter, John, Thomas, and the rest, they all thought it was over. Jesus had failed, they thought. They had failed. The dreams of the kingdom had failed. Everything they had hoped for was finished. And then two days later, they were hearing crazy rumors about Jesus being seen around Jerusalem. Some of the women were telling wild tales, they thought, about seeing him and touching him. Was there no respect for the dead? Were they trying to add insult to injury? Would there never be an end to this taunting, they thought? Some of them had rushed to the tomb and found it empty, but that probably only meant that the Romans had taken his body and reburied it in a secret place. One thing they knew, death is final, irreversible. It was over. Nothing would ever be right again. Jesus was dead. Then in that room, whose door was shut and locked, Jesus was standing before them. Could they believe their eyes? Had the rumors been true? Maybe they pinched themselves, but they weren't dreaming. He was there, and he was alive and with them again. Death wasn't irreversible after all. Neither was their pain, unbelief, and fear final. Their crushing sense of failure can now give way to confidence. They could be bold in the Jesus name. When this startling realization fixed itself in their hearts, the same man who had crept away from Golgotha in fear would stand in the streets of Jerusalem to preach that the crucified but raised Christ is the Lord and Savior of all. Well, friends, Easter signals the same truth of reversibility to every one of us. There is no childhood trauma, no humiliating moral failure, no diagnosis of terminal illness, no episode of failed faith that is final. The empty tomb of Easter morning means that darkness can be replaced by light, that failure can be replaced by victory, and that death can be replaced by life itself. Easter is not just a special spring Sunday. It is ultimate proof that no bad thing, not even death itself, is final. So here's the question. Do you believe it? Do you really believe it? Many of you know of Lee Strobel and the movie that just came out based on his book, The Case for Christ. Lee has often shared his testimony of having been an atheist. He was an investigative journalist who had a law degree and he sought to investigate whether or not it could be possible that Jesus was who he claimed to be, that he really did conquer sin and death. I want to share part of one of his testimonies with you right now. He says this, I started my original investigation of the resurrection of Jesus as a spiritual skeptic, but after having thoroughly investigated the evidence for the resurrection, I was coming to a startling, unexpected verdict. One final fact described by a respected philosopher named J.P. Moreland clinched the case for me. When Jesus was crucified, Moreland told me, his followers were discouraged and depressed, so they dispersed. The Jesus movement was all but stopped in its tracks. Then after a short period of time, we see them abandoning their occupations, regathering, and committing themselves to spreading a very specific message that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of God who died on a cross, returned to life, and was seen alive by them. And they were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming this without any payoff from a human point of view. They faced a life of hardship, they often went without food. They slipped the elements. They were ridiculed, beaten, imprisoned. And finally, most of them were executed in torturous ways. For what? For good intentions? No. Because they were convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that they had seen Jesus Christ alive from the dead. Yes, people will die for their religious convictions if they sincerely believe they are true. Religious fanatics have done that throughout history. While they may strongly believe in the tenets of their religion, however, they don't know for a fact whether their faith is based on the truth. They simply cannot know for sure. They can only believe. In stark contrast, the disciples were in the unique position to know for a fact whether Jesus had returned from the dead. They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. They knew he wasn't a hallucination or a legend. And knowing the truth, they were willing to die for him. 
Lee Strobel says that insight stunned me. The disciples didn't merely believe in the resurrection. They knew whether it was fact or fiction. Had they known it was a lie, they would never have been willing to sacrifice their lives for it. Nobody willingly dies for something they know is false. They proclaim the resurrection to their deaths for one reason alone. They knew it was true. And based on the historical data I have examined, I have become convinced that they were right. Combined with the other evidence for Jesus that I describe in my book, The Case for Christ, I concluded that he really is the one and only Son of God who proved it by rising from the dead. And as soon as I reached that monumental verdict, the implications were obvious. If Jesus overcame the grave, then he's still alive and available for me to personally encounter. If Jesus conquered death, he can open the door of eternal life for me too. If he has divine power, he has the supernatural ability to guide and transform me as I follow him. As my creator, who has my best interest at heart, he rightfully deserves my allegiance and my worship. And friends, he deserves that from every one of us too. If he really is the risen Lord. In Acts chapter 2, as Peter concluded that first gospel message that had ever been preached, as our praise team gets ready, it comes on back up here. I want to share with you the response of the crowd that day and what Peter told them to do. Peter concludes his sermon this way, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Friends, that's the question today. If you've not already done this, but you believe that Jesus really did die on that cross, if you believe that he rose again, then that's the question you need to be asking today. Brothers, what do I need to do now? What's my response to this? Here's what Peter told them. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Peter didn't stop there. He went on to say, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. You know what that means? It means that promise is here for you today. It means that if you would come believing, repenting of your sin, today you could be buried with Christ in baptism. You could rise to new life with the absolute guarantee of victory over sin and the grave. We've got our baptismal pool back at our building ready for anybody who needs to take that step today. It's just right up the street. We'll go with you. We'll go up there. If you haven't been baptized yet, you can go and be obedient today and celebrate new life in Christ. If you're here today and you've already been obedient to the gospel and baptism, but you have not been living a life worthy of that calling you've received, that today is a day for fresh start, for new beginning, for you. Today, because of what Jesus did for you on the cross, you can come back in repentance before him and recommit your life to him and begin a new walk with him even today. If you're here today and you don't have a church home that you're connected to or a part of, then we want to invite you to make Lakeshore your church home. If you live here in this area, we would love for you to be part of our family at Lakeshore. Together we, we serve the risen Savior. And it's all to his glory, to his honor, that we live the life he's called us to live. And we would love to invite you to come and join with us in that. I know it might be a little distance to walk today, but that just means the commitment's that much stronger. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And if you need to make a decision or a commitment of your life to Christ, just come right down those steps, right all the way down to the floor here. We'll be down here to welcome you and greet you and lead you in the steps that you need to take. We'll pray with you as you make that commitment of your life to Him. As we stand and sing, just come right on down front.